Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our last panel. Thank you all for coming and joining us. And uh, the title of our panel is Ethnic Divisions Among Israel's Jewish Society. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our panel presenters and discussant. Uh, Efrat Yerdai is an activist, writer, poet, cultural entrepreneur, and Bama artist resident. She is the chair of the Association of Ethiopian Jews and a PhD candidate in sociology at Tel Aviv University, researching ethno-national citizenship and Jewish illegality. Ethiopian Jews in Israel between 1955 1975, and the struggle for citizenship. Hillel Cohen is a um, historian, author, lecturer, and ex-activist. He was the head of the Cherik Center for the Study of Zionism and the head of the Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, his last book is Haters, a Love Story, on Mizrahim and Arabs and Ashkenazim too, published in Hebrew in 2022, and forthcoming in English next year, inshallah, with Penn State University Press. Uh, Yuval Ivry is assistant professor of uh, Near Eastern and Judaic Studies and Marash and Okun chair in Ottoman, Mizrahi, and Sephardic Jewish Studies at Brandeis University. He is a cultural uh, historian and uh, specializing in Sephardi, Mizrahi, modern history and culture. His book, The Return to Al-Andalus, Disputes Over Sephardi Culture and Identity Between Arabic and Hebrew, was published by Magnus Press in 2020. And our discussant is Tzvi Bendor Benit. He is a longtime uh, uh, Mizrahi activist and writer. He is currently a member of the Mizrahi Civic Collective, Outside Politics. He is uh, a professor in the Department of History, the Department of Middle Eastern studies and, and Islamic studies, I'm sorry, at New York University, and by courtesy in the Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at New York University. His um, last book is a co-edited co volume, Time and Language, New Synology and Chinese History, which came out in Hawaii University Press 2023. So um, um, these are our uh, panel presenters and discussions, discussant. So please um, uh, join me in welcoming them. And uh, let's start with um, um, with Efrat, Efrat Yerda, please. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for surviving until now. Um, in this talk, I will give a brief historical overview of Ethiopian Jewish Aliyah immigration. I will argue that this history is relevant to understanding today's anomalous Ethiopian-Israeli status. I believe the case of Ethiopians is a good example of understanding the significant role of ethnicity and race in Israel's state logic. I will show that the state rejected Ethiopian Jews for a long time, I believe this encounter has a tremendous effect on today's systemic racism toward Ethiopian Jews by the state and the lack of trust of Ethiopians in the state's formal institutions. Any current sociological phenomena can be linked to its historical roots, and this linkage is significant in solving communities' historical pains and injustices. Also, I'm thrilled to take part in this brilliant panel. Um, having said that, this panel should have opened the conference uh, and not been the last panel presented. Its placement at the end of the conference is a reminder of the marginalization of discussion of race and ethnicity. If we analyze Israeli society through its ethnic and racial divisions, especially within Jewish society, we can gain a broader and deeper understanding of today's political situation. And now to what I prepared. Since the establishment of the State of Israel and even prior, Ethiopian Jews immigrated to Israel primarily as individuals. 
They heard about the establishment of the Jewish state and about people from their communities who reached the promised land. Uh, so these are the people, some of the people who were in Israel, uh, as you see. Um, they also remembered that some people came to Israel and got lost. I'm referring to people who arrived in Israel in the late 19th, uh, 19th and early 20th century. The relationship, uh, the relationship between Israel and Ethiopia was established formally in 1958, but was always a warm and strong relationship, even under most years of the communist regime uh, dictatorship in Ethiopia between 1974 and 1991. Ethiopia was one of three strategic countries. The other two were Iran and Turkey. The United States promoted the periphery alliance led by the first prime minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, uh, and the minister of foreign affairs, Golda Meir. Um, Ethiopia had an interest in these relations that were supposed to be hidden from the eyes of pro-Palestinian states at the time, such as Egypt of Nasser and Libya of Muammar Gaddafi. For example, Ethiopia refused to open an embassy in Israel and at the only consulate, it didn't harm the strong alliance from a macro perspective. Israel enjoyed being in alliance with Ethiopia for security reasons and sea access for trade and information in a place surrounded by Muslim states, such as Sudan and uh, Somalia. On the other hand, it enjoyed Israel, uh, Ethiopia enjoyed Israeli development in various fields, from the departments of the Addis Ababa University to the architecture of the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, security methods, of course, arms exchange, and the training of military units. Israel did its best not to call attention to the Ethiopian Jewish issue. The Foreign Affairs Ministry that worked intensively in Ethiopia was stuck between Ethiopian Jews' appeal to, immigrant, to, uh, to immigrate to Israel and, and Jews that arrived in Ethiopia following stories and rumors on the black Jews of Ethiopia, mainly uh, Jews from the United States, um, and they encountered Ethiopian Jews and, the, and their appeals for Aliyah. One of the people who arrived in Israel in 1970 was uh, my father, who left his home in northern Ethiopia, Tigray, and arrived to Israel by boat and entered Israel by tourist visa. My father and others who arrived during the 60s and the 70s remained in Israel after visa extension and expirations. During these times, the state of Israel did not acknowledge the Jewishness of Ethiopian Jews, People who ask for a visa from the Israeli embassy in Ethiopia usually didn't receive it. For example, on November 14, 1972, the Israeli embassy in Addis Ababa sent a letter to the consular, uh, consular department regarding two requests for entry visa. Quote, because I suspect that these two are Falasha, Falasha is a degradatory name that was very mainstream at these days, who intend to stay in Israel, I'm asking for your instructions. The embassy of Israel in Ethiopia did not know precisely how to deal with Ethiopians they suspected wanted to immigrate and not to tour. In 1971 and 1972, the Ministry of Interior under Yosef Bourg from the Mafdal party, the ancestor party of the religious Zionist party of today, issued visa expiry announcement and demanded the immediate departure of several Ethiopian Jews, what we, what, what we can call a deportation order. These groups of individuals didn't get the support that any Jew who want to immigrate to Israel receive. On the contrary, they had to hide from the state and were without legal status, so they were exposed to human rights violations. They were almost the only black people in Israel. They're uh, like real black because there were brown people, uh, uh, what here you can call uh, black people as well. Their appearance was strange. During these years, they met frequently with the Sephardi Mizrahi Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Ovad Yosef, and when they received these deportation orders, they asked for his help. Rabbi Yosef concluded that Ethiopians were part of the Jewish people and made this announcement public. The rule of Rabbi Yosef was contested by diverse public figures, bureaucrats, institutions, and authorities from all sides and angles of the political and religious map, religious, secular, right, left, Ashkenazi, and Mizrahi. 
One of the interesting reactions was of the Ministry of Absorption Integration that published a report on Ethiopian Jews by scholar Yosef Litvak. In this report, Litvak explains why the Falashas are not Jews and why the State of Israel shouldn't bring them to Israel. He argued that Ethiopian Jews suffer from a genetic disease, that they are not genealogically Jews, which is interesting to think about genealogy in the Jewish context, but, uh, uh, but people who actually converted to Judaism and not real Jews, and that the state could not allow another interracial conflict, referring to the Black Panthers of Israel of the 70s. Conflicting authorities and bureaucrats' interests allowed this group to remain in Israel, though in a vague legal status. In April 1975, apparently under a government resolution, Ethiopian Jews became eligible for the law of return. To this moment, I have been unable to find any record of this resolution. But I might know that it occurred in the same year that the resolution 3379, that Zionism equated racism, was confirmed in the, U in the UN. In 1975, there were already around 150 Ethiopian Jews in Israel, leading a struggle to bring their families. The state rejected their appeal repeatedly until the early 80s. The state of Israel tells a very different story from what I just shared with you. It presents the heroic airlift of Ethiopian Jews in November 1984. This airlift can only be considered heroic if we censor out the 36 years since the establishment of the State of Israel when Ethiopian Jews were not eligible for the law of return. A particularly striking dynamic characterizes nationalism in Israel. On the one hand, the desire to secure a Jewish majority, uh, and on the other hand, to give, pre to give preference to the European identity of immigrants over the Jewish component. It is evident from the 1970 amendment of the law of return, which allowed for the naturalization of immigrants, mainly from the uh, USSR, who, who had been considered non-Jews by the earlier uh, law definition. Archival documents um, that I found after five years <laughs> Uh, from the Ministry of Interior point, point out clearly that the main reason for this amendment was to allow European non-Jews to naturalize. You can actually be a second-class citizen with no need for written racist laws. Systemic racism, racism toward non-white Jews is part of the state logic. The Israeli narrative, the one perpetuated either within popular writing, culture, or through academic scientific research, not only contradicts the historical reality, which I have just briefly presented to you, but it also begins the story almost from its end. Based on this historical background, can we be surprised by systemic racism toward Ethiopian Jews by the Rabbanut of today? by health administration that deny blood donation based on skin color, by the shooting within one year in 2019 of two Ethiopian youth by police officers and the detention of disproportionate rates of Ethiopian youth, by unique integration policies for Ethiopian Jews that, fit, that fits to the integration policies of the, Mizrach, the Mizrachim in the Ma'abarot of the, of the 50s, uh, such as the, which is mandatory for Ethiopian Jews only. Um, this deviation from state logic in the Ethiopian case are part of the state logic. So why as academics and people who are involved in social change do we still insist on talking about race and ethnicity as though it is an appetizer or dessert for the main dish? Why do we still insist on discussing Israeli society while putting aside race and ethnicity? Why don't we analyze Israel with the tools we use to analyze other democracies? It is possible to understand the demonst is it is it possible to understand the demonstrations? Um, and yeah, I was too focused on this. Uh, is it possible to understand the demonstration in Kaplan these days and the supporters of the government without talking about ethnicity? Uh, we must look at this history that is deeply engaged in questions about race, blackness, and whiteness in the Jewish society. Ethiopian Jews are in Israel contrary to the position of the state. The struggle for equality, recognition, and justice continues. Thank you very much.
My name is Hillel Cohen, and I'm a historian, historian citizen of Israel. On May 12, 2021, meaning two years ago, dozens of young Jews gathered in Batyam, which is a city just the south of Tel Aviv, and went out in groups to attack Arab-owned businesses on the city streets. They smashed windows of restaurants, smashed furniture inside, and looted them. A young Arab Palestinian man from Ramla, Said Musa, ran into the street in his car and found himself trapped among the mob. He was identified as an Arab and was forcibly removed from his car and was attacked with fists and iron rods, thrown to the ground, and the mob kicked him and stepped on him until his face was crushed and he lost consciousness. The attack continued even when he was unconscious. There were no police forces there on the sufficient scale, and the few citizens who tried to prevent the lynching were repulsed behind. The event took place in front of uh, TV cameras, which broadcasted it in real time. The attackers, for the most part, did not try to hide their actions. Some proudly raised Israeli flags, hoping their friends would see them on TV. However, the presence of the cameras had also an unexpected result. Soon after the event, the police began to arrest the participant in the lynching based on the footage. Now, the lynching in Batyam was part of a broad violent outburst in Israel-Palestine. It was Jerusalem Day in which Israelis, mostly right-wing religious youth, commemorate the liberation or the occupation of Arab Jerusalem in 1967. In 2021, the celebrations fo followed decisions of Israeli courts to evict Palestinians from previously Jewish-owned homes in Arab Jerusalem and mass pilgrimage of Jews to, tem to Temple Mount Al-Aqsa Mosque. Hamas, Haraket al-Mukawa al Islamiyyeh, warned Israel that if the visits and celebration continues, it would launch missile attack on Israel and did so. Israel response, responded with heavy bombardment of Gaza Strip. Violent attacks on, of Arabs on Jews and vice versa followed soon in the mixed cities. The lynch in Batyam should be seen in this context. But what these events in Batyam has to do with ethnic relations in Israel or with the Ashkenazim Israeli tensions? The answer is simple. 12 Israeli Jews were arrested for their participation in the lynch. All 12 were Mizrahi Jews. This was not that surprising, actually, because we know that in recent anti-Arab riots inside Israel, including the burning down of the Jewish Arab school in Jerusalem and the burning to death of Muhammad Abu Khder in Jerusalem in 2014, and other events, the perpetrators were also Mizrahim. So it seems that everyone who is interested in Israeli society, in Jewish Arab, in Jewish Arab relations, and in intra-Jewish relations should ask himself why or how come that Mizrahi Jews are perpetrators of such acts. Before I attempt to answer this question, I'd like to tell you about another violent incident that happened some four kilometers to the north of Batyam, that is in Jaffa, 113 years earlier, in 1908. In this incident, a group of Jews organized to revenge sexual harassment of a Jewish woman by an Arab. They stabbed Palestinian by, a Palestinian guy by knife. We don't know if this Palestinian was involved in the attack or the harassment of the, of the girl. And then they were attacked by the police, the Ottoman police. We are talking about 1908. The point for us now is that all Jewish attackers at that incident in 1908, all of them were Ashkenazim. And all of them were of the labor movement. And all of them were members of the second Aliyah. More importantly, the Sephardi Jews of Jaffa and Jerusalem, at least some of them, blamed the East European Jews and argued that their arrival in Palestine causes tensions between Jews and Arabs. Since they, the Sephardi Jews, 
Jews to live peacefully with the Arabs of Palestine. Some of these Faradi Jews even argued that it is better, and they told the Ottoman authorities that it's better to send these Zionists back to Russia, that they have no place in our Arab Jewish homeland. Naturally enough, the Zionist activist blamed them of being unnationalist, anti-Zionist, and actually defined them as Arabs. So in the following minutes, not many, I'll try to answer the question which is similar in some aspect to the electoral question. Why do Mizrahim for, vote for the right wing? Though I'm not the person to answer this statistic question, but I'm more interested in the question, why do Mizrahim, and I, I'm also not sure that Mizrahim vote for the right wing much more than Ashkenazi Jews. I think it is not exact. But for me, I'm more interested in violent attacks and why Mizrahim is involved more in violent attacks on Arabs. And this is fact. But this is fact. It's not the full story. I have to, to tell also that when I speak about Mizrahi violence, this is true within the Green Line, meaning within the state of Israel. When we speak about anti-Arab violence outside the Green Line, meaning in the West Bank, most of the attackers are Ashkenazi Jews. So this is also one point. The other point is that in the very same week of the attacks, I mean in 2021, of two, I mean two, three people were killed. Two of, Jew, two of them were Jews, one of them were Arabs inside Israel. But dozens of Arabs were killed by the IDF in Gaza. So we speak about totally different kinds of violence and I focus on illegal or unauthorized violence by Israeli citizens within the state of Israel. So also I have to say that what I'm not arguing that Mizrahi Jews before or, the, or the, before the establishment of the state of Israel or at the beginning of Zionism where all of them were Arab lovers or all Ashkenazi were haters who born to hate. The argument is that as a socio-political group, the Ashkenazi, they were referred to as Moscovim, meaning who came from Russia, of the second and third Aliyah, which became the hegemonic group of Israeli society, were more militant, more brutal, and less tolerant towards Arabs than Sephardim. In addition, European Jews, Ashkenazim, advocated the idea of separation. They advocated Jewish labor, established separate settlements, kibbutzim and, and moshavim, and their ideal was the establishment of a Jewish state. All this as opposed to Sephardim, including those who supported the Zionist movement, who lived and preferred living in shared cities, who rejected the idea of jo jobs to Jews only, who were well aware or acknowledged the fact that Palestine is a national home not only of the Jews, but also of the Arabs. So what happened in these years, I mean, between 1908 and 2021, that changed so much the attitude of Mizrahim to the Arabs of Palestine? So first of all, we can speak about the geopolitical situation. The difference between the Ottoman period to the period of the State of Israel, of course, is visible to everybody. I mean, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, then the British Mandate with the Balfour Declaration, the establishment of the Jewish state. So we are talking about totally different ge geopolitical reality. But this is not the only answer. There is another important issue, which is, of course, the Arab anti-Zionist violence. The Arab anti-violence that started together with Zionism and was a result of the Zionist aspiration to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Most of its victims in the first stages in 1929, in Morot as we call it in Hebrew, and also the first wave of the Arab revolt of 1936, most of them were Sephardi Jews. So this was one important reason for 
their alignment with the Zionist movement and with a more radical wing of the Zionist movement. But this was not true only for pre-state period. This was also true in the 50s with the, what was called the infiltrators, Palestinian, many refugees who entered Israel as Fidayin and attacked Israeli settlers. It was also true in the 1970s, the huge, infamous terror attacks on mostly Mizrahi towns like Ma'alot, like Bet She'an, like Kirat Shmone, even Moshav Avivim, where most victims were Mizrahi. So this is, of course, another important reason. But it cannot consider the only reason, because at the same time also Ashkenazi communities were attacked. This is true for the uh, 20s and 30s, and this is true for the 70s, and this is also true for the Second Intifada. So we have to think about other complementary explanation. The next explanation, which we, of course, we combine all explanations, they are not exclusive, is if we, if we look, for example, at these 12 people who participated, there were much more than 12, but these 12 that we have material on them because they were brought to trial, I can tell you that all of them were Mizrahim. But I also can tell you that none of them had master's degree from Yale in biochemistry. What I'm trying to say is that all of them were, not all of them finished high school, and most of them or were partly unemployed. So we can say they belong to the lower class, to the working class, or to would-be even working class. And this is very different from the situation of Sephardim in the 1910s, 1920s, uh, 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 meaning during the Ottoman and mandate, mandate period. So what I'm speaking about is about communities that was pushed to the margins. And this community was pushed to the margins not only after the must the mass aliyah or immigra immigration to, to Israel after the establishment of the state, but already after the rise to power of the labor movement in the 1930s. In 1930, the labor mo movement became the hegemonic power of Israel. And already in 1937, we have also signs before, the heads of the Sephardi communities in Jerusalem and elsewhere, they wrote to the Zionist leadership the following letter. Since you came here, you took over all the jobs. You spoke about taking the jobs from Arabs, but you took also the jobs from the Sephardim. Our life under the Ottomans before you came were much better. This is what they said. And this, of course, continued after the establishment of the State of Israel and the mass immigration of Jews from the East and from North Africa. I, I, I published several books, and the last book is about this, about the, the triangle of relations between Mizrahi, Ashkenazi, and Arabs. I don't participate in the protest against the current government. It is very difficult for me to, to participate in it. But I go to visit once a, a while because many of my friends go there. And a couple of weeks ago, I went, and two ladies came to me, and they said, one said to the another, you know, this is Professor Hillel Cohen. And the other said, hi, Hillel Cohen, I read your book about 1929. It's a great book, which indeed is a great book. <laughs> and she, she, she said, it changed my life. I know now about Jews and Arabs, about the, the, the roots of the, of the conflict, and so on and so forth. I said, thank you very much. And then she continued and said, but your recent book, I'm not going to read it. I'm not going to read it. I asked, why don't you? She said, because you blame the Ashkenazim for the suffering of the Mizrahim. And you know, I am from Safed, from Tzfat. And my mother used to make sandwiches to the kids of the newcomers from Morocco and Tunisia. How come that you say that the, all the problems is the result of Ashkenazi behavior 
towards the, the, the newcomers. I said, I'm not sure that I mentioned the sandwiches of your mother in my book, but also I can tell you that I don't blame the Ashkenazim. What I'm trying to do in my book is to tell how they were absorbed, absorbed by, the, by the establishment. And because I'm a historian, as I apologize at the beginning of my work, I go to the archives, as Efra does, and I find what for, for, for historians is many times, can, can, we can call it the smoking gun, which is a lecture by David Ben-Gurion in 1956, in which David Ben-Gurion tells the public, the public in this case was a conference of MAPAI, of the Labour Party, and he tells them, you know, in the recent or last eight, ten years, we received a lot of money from, the, from world jewelry, from many states, in order to absorb the newcomers. And look what happened. These newcomers are still in the Mabarot, in the transit camp, and our Ramat Chaim, quality of life, increased. Look what happened. The money went to us, not to them. Now in the Israeli discourse, when you try to say anything about what happened in the 50s and 60s to the newcomers from the, the, the Islamic world, usually you are attacked because how come? The, the state was in a very difficult situation. We did our best. Our kids went to the army and our daughters went to teach them Hebrew and to show them the light and so on and so forth. But people who were there and experienced it, our families, they have different experience. So it's like a word against word. And this is why as historians, we sometimes have to find out what was said and what was done in, those, in this period. So this lecture of, of Begurion for me is like, you know, you should know that it was like that. I mean, you cannot tell only personal stories. I believe to the personal stories because many Israeli, Israeli Jews, Ashkenazim and non-Ashkenazim alike, they have good hearts. Of course they would help someone who is hungry and live next to them. But on the other hand, we have to look at the structure, and the structure was like that, that the absorption was poor, that they were, they were tracked to the periphery of the state of Israel, and that they were tracked or channeled to schools from which they cannot go to higher education. And the result was, first of all, that if you are in the margins, there is more probability that you will participate in violent activities. This is, we, we see and race, race riots everywhere in the world, and usually you don't see doctors and dentists participating in, this, in these riots. So the class issue here is not less important than, than the ethnic division. The second is, and this has to do with the, with, with the current protest. And just uh, yesterday, there was a huge debate on Facebook about whether this protest is Ashkenazi or not. And for many people, this is Ashkenazi protest. And why it is Ashkenazi protest? Because actually, what happened is that after 1977, after the, the, the upheaval, you say, after Likud, after Likud came to power for the first time, this was the first time in which a peace camp, an Israeli peace camp was established. I mean, between 67 and 77, the Labor Party built the, the, the settlements. There was no problem. After 77, they started to realize there's something called human rights. We believe in human rights. We are anti-occupation. We, 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 we speak about equality. Yeah, we support equality. So this was uh, what I call it a takeover of human rights by the hated ex-establishment. The same people, the same very people, or the, now their descendants, who were, part, who were part of the discrimination against Mizrahim. Now they, ta they talk in the name of equality, in the name of democracy. Who can join them? I mean, even if they are right. They are right, because the current government is not very good. 
And they planned, the, what they plan is, is terrible to our future. But it's so difficult, it's so difficult to swallow this frog and go to the streets with these people, to many, many, many Israelis. And I, 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 I cannot represent them. I, 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 I mean, because I, never mind, I mean, this is my biography, but, but this, this, this is part of, of, of also the tribal question, why we have tribes, and we do have tribes, and people vote according to tribes, they support or do not support the, 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 the government and, 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 and the reform because of the tribes. So what can be done? Actually, it is very simple. Very simple, but for many, many people, it's almost impossible. It's to acknowledge the truth, to acknowledge the truth. Like here in the United States, I, I visited, like many other visitors here, the African American Museum. And we know that the wealth of the United States is a result of slavery. We know it. Nobody can deny it. We know that the wealth of Europe is the result of colonialism and slavery. And we have also to acknowledge the same in the state of Israel, that the, the arriving of the, of, the, of, the, of the higher class or the, the, the middle high class in Israel was a result of the hard work of the working with Rahi class. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Erez. Thank you, Michael and uh, Laura, for inviting me. I'm glad to be with this great uh, panel. And, uh, and Hillel's book is wonderful, 1929. And also the new book, I'm so glad it's going to be translated to English. And I'm going to use it in class, as I do with 1929. And many of the things that I'm going to talk here is very much connected to, to his work and, and Zvi's work and others uh, here. Uh, so our conference title, uh, Building Bridges, Overcoming the Gaps in, in Israeli Society, embodies two key images or concepts associated with the Mizrahi history and identity in Israel. The first one is bridge or bridges or the act of bridging between cultures and groups. And the second is gaps, uh, like ethnic and social gaps and over gapping, overcoming the gaps. These terms are central to understanding the roots uh, of the et ethnic uh, uh, divide in Israel, as well as the, ish, uh, the use and misuse of uh, Mizrahi history in the current political uh, discourse. So the image of, um, of the Mizrahi Jews as a bridge between the Arabs and Jews, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Gesher Le Shalom, uh, or the Bridge for Peace, uh, dates back to the early days of the, uh, of the Zionist issue in Palestine and to the early days of the conflict. The local Mizrahim were identified as go-betweeners, as mediators, uh, situated on the borderline uh, that emerged between the, the Jew and the Arab and between Hebrew and Arabic languages. Their primary role was seen as bridging uh, uh, the two cultural, uh, cultures and national identities while maintaining the clear separation lines between them. They were expected to support the Jewish national struggle as translators and interpreters, uh, yet were also associated with the danger of mixing with Arab Palestinians and crossing the linguistic, social, and cultural uh, borders. They were therefore suspected of dual loyalties, treason, or promoting cultural uh, assimilation. The metaphor of Mizrahim as bridge was linked with their image and role as mediators and neighbors. The mediator's function requires the mediator themselves to be a neighbor, being close to the other culture. At the particular stage, being neighbors with Arabs become a security uh, or intelligence asset. They may start listening to their neighbors, following uh, following uh, them, obtaining information from them, impersonating them, analyzing them, and so on. Their position in the gap, in the middle uh, between two cultures, became a trap. The more Mizrahim were identified as the border people, go-betweeners, mediators, or translators, the more their pre-national history within multilingual 
and multi-ethnic spaces with multiple loyalties was erased. To use Bruno Latour's conceptualization, the more Mizrahi were identified and constructed as hybrid creatures, uh, Latour calls it or terms it translations, the more profound the, and substantial the polarization along linguistic, national, cultural, and identity lines between Jews and Arabs, between Hebrew and Arabic uh, became. So this hybridization and, and polarization process co-occur together. Since 1948 and the mass immigration to Israel, Mizrahim also has also been associated with different notions uh, of cultural, educational, social, and economic gaps. Uh, you know, a para adati, a para tarbuti, a para chavrati, mostly in the relation uh, in relation to uh, Ashkenazi Jews. The gaps became a key term in the academic and scholarly literature around the Mizrahi issue and the Mizrahi Ashkenazi ethnic divide. In this course, in this uh, discourse, one of the main reasons or roots of, for these uh, gaps was the gap between the Mizrahi culture and modernity and between Mizrahim and Western way of life. The task of bridging this gap was placed on the Mizrahi themselves, who were uh, expected to distance themselves from their uh, Arab Jewish Mizrahi past and uh, their cultural, linguistic, and religious traditions. The task of bridging uh, these gaps became a vehicle and the justification for separating Mizrahi kids from their families in boarding schools, residing Mizrahim in the periphery, and marginalizing their Arabic culture, music, and literature. These processes that aim to bridge the gaps just deepened the gaps further and created a division between what the, then we called first Israel and second Israel. Since then, it's, it's been used differently. So Israel Arishona and Israel Ashniya, a term that was abused and weaponized by different political forces along the years, including most recently the current right wing uh, government. So now we can see why the metaphor of bridging the gaps has a complex history regarding Mizrahi, Mizrahim in Israel, and I will be more careful to use it. When Mizrahim are identified as a bridge or representative of the social gaps, they are usually portrayed as objects without uh, agency, passive actors that are either victims or followers, but without any agency or role or active role in changing of it. In the, in the current uh, crisis, we can see it very, it's a great uh, example of it because Mizrahi, the Mizrahi story, so-called uh, Israel Ashniya, the second Israel, has been used by the uh, right-wing uh, 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 government that uh, didn't do anything for, for decades, as the Tzvi said yesterday, to help the Mizrahim whatsoever, but they identify themselves as second Israel, and they uh, 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 proclaim that they're going to help the Mizrahim uh, 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 with this uh, reform that they are uh, suggesting, even though Mizrahim themselves, again, are only an object here. They are not a really active agency. In that, in that sense, or they don't have any active role in that. This cynical uh, you know, uh, claim got to really uh, uh, grotesque uh, uh, moments, like in the last Mimuna party in the, in the end of the Pesach, some Ashkenazi right-wing settlers wearing uh, Moroccan costumes went to Aaron Barak's house and, and claimed that they are a second Israel. And this kind of, of scenes you can, see, you can see everywhere. But the use and misuse of Second Israel is not by the right wing over the history. Um, and the, the, but the, more importantly for, here to, for me to say here is that the notion of passive objects, uh, this notion of passive object, overlook the rich and important history of Mizrahi thought and activism and the different political and cultural options they offered over the years from native Sephardi intellectuals that uh, Hillel in Palestine in the early 20th century, uh, to Wadi Salib, Black Panthers, and today's work of the uh, Mizrahi Civic uh, Collective. In these groups and this philosophy and thought that, uh, that uh, we, I think that it's, it's, uh, now it's a moment that we can also invite or try to go back to it. Instead of bridging in this Mizrahi thought, Instead of bridging the gap, the Mizrahim tried to create a space uh, on the gaps, 
on the borderlands. They try to create a vocabulary and institutions that will accommodate these boundary positions. Instead of building bridges, they try to highlight intersections uh, and connectivity between the religious and secular, the Arab and the Jew, and between Hebrew and Arabic. Instead of serving as a bridge that people walk on, they try to transform the contact zones into a new cultural and political uh, possibility. Moreover, the historical Mizrahi struggle for recognition and equality has always, or in most cases, has been on ground on universal values and the demand on, uh, for comprehensive justice for all. Uh, the notion of solidarity that we said yesterday, but also the universal way of looking at, at justice and claim for justice. So, for example, the struggles of the communist uh, Mizrahim in the 1950s, the uprising of Wadi Salib in the end of the 1950s, the Mizrahi Black Panthers in the 1970s, the tent movement in the 1980s, the Mizrahi Democratic Rainbow in the 1990s, and the 21st century feminist Mizrahi movement, Achoti, and the uh, Shovot Kirot, Breaking Walls, have all stood for systematic change, not only a change for Mizrahi uh, per se. This was also the spirit underlining the Mizrahi uh, petition against the nation state law. In, current, the, in the current crisis, there is another movement that's connected, is, or maybe continued this kind of legacy, uh, is the, the, the Mizrahi uh, Civic Collective, Collective uh, Mizrahi uh, Ezrahi, that Tzvi is part of it, and Hillel, and I am also, and it's led by wonderful people in Israel, uh, uh, among them Neta Shif, uh, Shif uh, Amar Shif, and, and uh, Orli Noy, and, uh, and, uh, and Yael Barda, and uh, Yosidan, and many, many, many others. And I think the, the interesting thing that, uh, and I really recommend you to go and, and look for it, and you can see a website on it, it's not only to participate in, in demonstrations, but also to bring a, a new voice that we don't have any illusion about the past. We don't want to go into any past. We don't think that was a democracy, equal democracy for everyone in Israel before this reform uh, came uh, to life, and not for the Arabs, not for Mizrahi Jews, not for asylum seekers, not for Ethiopian Jews, for many, many other groups. Uh, but we, don't, we understand that this reform is not something that will bring this kind of a solution. Okay? And I think that what the, the collective is doing is not only participating in, uh, in demonstration, is writing uh, um, uh, policy papers in each, each of the subjects. So in law, in education, uh, uh, in uh, housing, and so on and so forth. And you can find it all online. Some of them have been translated to English. Some of them are in the process of it. Uh, so I think that this is, again, you can see how this is another legacy of the Mizrahi struggle that, uh, again, not all the Mizrahim are, are, are participating in that. Uh, sadly, today, most of them are not. But this is a legacy that we can, this is a moment that we can claim back uh, beyond this kind of borders and boundaries and, and, and bridging gaps and, 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 uh, and, that, and that kind of, of conversation. Uh, and I think that is also a moment for us, people that are teaching on Israel, some of us are teaching here in Israel, this moment is another opportunity. Uh, and I think it's, it's uh, the, the current ongoing uh, political events in Israel and Palestine with the increasing violence, uh, confrontation and hostility between Arabs and Jews, between religious and secular, and between Mizrahim and Ashkenazim, limit the ability to speak and imagine a shared society. The hostile environment also limits our capacity to teach and research the history and present of Israel-Palestine in its fullness and complexity. This is the opportunity to re-engage with the Mizrahi history experience uh, and experience through the lens of contact zones and borderlands and transcend the national perspective based on binary divisions between languages, identities, territories, and tradition. It's an opportunity to challenge some basic assumptions categorizations and terminology that organized official Jewish and Arab historiography and to problematize clear-cut separation between Jews and Arabs, Hebrew and Arabic, and Israel and the Middle East, which guide most of our current official political and historical discourse. It's an opportunity to explore geographies that position Jewish history and Israel studies in the Middle Eastern uh, history 
Instead of imagining purified national territories and societies with clear-cut boundary or borderlines, to draw different maps with thick borderlands uh, that represent complex and intertwined cultural and geographical connection. It's an opportunity to identify cultural and political visions that emerge at the time, but were negated, marginalized, and forgotten. And to trace episodes of resistance, disruption, uh, and uh, dispute that appeared during this crucial moment, but vanished from the official historical narrative. It's an opportunity to think about contemporary political and cultural reality outside uh, uh, the logic of partition, which has dominated political and academic discourse in Israel-Palestine for over a century. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we heard the three uh, uh, very tight uh, presentations. Um, I was listening and taking notes, so I was doing, as we say in Arabic, irtijalan, you know, improvising. Um, and I will try to do my best. Um, what we heard, I think, uh, if I want to summarize, you know, by one point, if I want to summarize what we heard here in the three presentations is, we looked at the history and the meaning of the limits of Zionist universalism in the land of Israel and in the, first in the land of Israel, mandatory Palestine, and then in uh, the state of Israel in the past 120 years, but also 120, uh, um, 75 years. The limits of its universalism. I mean, the beginning was by, by universalism. We can talk about the idea of the new Jew, yes? Which, by the way, the founding fathers never really imagined. They never said that the new Jew is going to be Ashkenazic. It was maybe implied. It was tacitly understood, yes? Maybe it was the nature of the new Jew, but it was supposed to be a new Jew. In other words, something other than any other Jews that existed in the world at that time, okay? I um, mean, by the way, the Zionist founding fathers were not uh, uh, the only ones in thinking about, speaking about a new type of a new Jew. I think, you know, in, in America there were experiments, and in the other uh, Jewish revolution of the 20th century that we tend to forget, the Bolshevik Revolution, there was also a type of a, a new Jew, okay? Um, except that, you know, I mean, Israel is different because Israel was a Jewish project, unlike the Bolshevik Revolution or the Great Migration from the Pale of Settlement to America. It was a Jewish project, there was a promise, and that promise, you know, turned out to be to have limits. Um, I am very grateful uh, that Efrat began actually with a historical overview, not just with explaining the current situation and the current social status and the problems, you know, with the, uh, with the uh, Ethiopian population in Israel. Why is this overview is, uh, necessary? Because this is a history that most of us do not know. Okay? Most of us do not know. I mean, we do not take for granted, you know, the Jewishness of Ethiopian Jewry the way we take it, uh, the way we take any other uh, 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 Jewishness of any other Jewish uh, population in the world. Okay? Um, in, in the case, I would, I would, and perhaps you can comment on my, my characterization later, but I would say in the case of Ethiopian Jewry, you know, it was a struggle, first of all, of self-identification and getting the state to recognize that case of self-identification. Self -identif and we're talking about, as we have seen, people arriving uh, uh, from Ethiopia already, is in, in early, uh, already in the times of early mandatory Palestine. And in fact, if we go back to the 16th century or to 17th century, you know, with documentations of Yemeni migration uh, 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 via the Red Sea, or as we used to call it, the Eritrean Sea, yes, to the land of Israel by way of pilgrimage, we don't can really tell if these be Jews coming actually from Ethiopia or from Yemen. Okay? So we don't know how these roots go back. And I think the need to start with a historical overview of Ethiopian Jewry, yes, with the point of you know, people coming and self-identifying, first of all, and forcing the Zionist establishment to recognize them as Jews, is very, very important. Okay? Um, so that's the first uh, point that I'd like to make about you know, the case of, uh, uh, the, case of the, 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 the Ethiopian Jewry in, in that. But of course, the second part of the conversation 
are rested on something that is more familiar to us. If we talk about ethnic divides within the Jewish population of Israel, yes, and discrimination and cases of, of, of racism. But here we see how, you know, the Ethiopian population that begins to arrive, you know, we heard about people coming already before the 70s or in the early 70s. But for most of us, you know, we have the glorious days of Mifta Shlomo and Mifta Moshe in the 80s and later. Okay, which were, by the way, represented as a heroic moment, which represented as a miracle, which represented as a rescue of here we are reaching out to the depths of Africa, rescuing you know, uh, uh, people and bringing them. And then if you remember, some of us will probably remember the, the um, incredibly annoying you know, way in which after everybody was gushing over the fact that the Ethiopians, they were so nice, they were so cute, and they didn't know how a toilet looked like, and they didn't know how an electricity looked like, et Etc. 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 It was a case of here we are. We rescued them. Okay, but that's where it ends because when you, when you come to Israel, you're being rescued. Then you're on your own. Okay, and being on your own is exactly what we see later on, where as opposed to let's say the Russian uh, migration, which by the way really suffered uh, uh, a lot. We should not deny that. You know, Ethiopian Jewry, you know, was left behind um, and was subjected to cases of extreme cases of police violence, um, uh, uh, discrimination of in, basically across the board in all spheres, in all spheres of life in a very, very extreme way, uh, extreme way. And it challenges us, I would say, not only, you know, it doesn't only uh, challenge the Ashkenazic uh, uh, hegemony in Israel. I think it also uh, it should ask, it also should challenge, you know, the Mizrahi uh, 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 counter hegemony in Israel as well. How much do we know? How much do we want to know? How much are we really? Uh, we really are engaged. I will mention. I will bring come to this point uh, at the second point later. So that my that is my first uh, uh, response. You know, to a uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, presentation. I mean, it is a challenge uh, uh, that remains a challenge. And if we speak about, you know, if we want to end, you know, we were told that we need to end with an optimistic uh, point of view. I would say that part of the new contract that Israel will need to sign with itself. Yes, we should begin, you know, with a, with a with a very serious conversation with the Ethiopian community and with its leadership. Not just the leadership, you know, that sometimes occasionally makes it to the Knesset, but the leadership that produces intellectuals uh, such as the one that we heard uh, today. Hillel Cohen is one of the fiercest uh, historians. Um, in Israel, who never, never shies away from looking at violence directly. Okay? I mean, I can say this, you know, after uh, many, many years uh, of friendship and dialogue and questioning and also debate. Okay? What he shows us, okay, the problematics of defining, you know, Mizrahi-Palestinian uh, Mizrahi uh, uh, violence is uh, the problematics of reducing it just to ethnicity. Okay. I would add that if you have a scale, I don't believe in, in, in the scales of ethnicity, but if you had a scale of ethnicity, the way people dress, the, pay, the way people behave, what they eat, you turns out that it would turn out that those 12 people that you mentioned are actually kind of ethnically Arab. In other words, if an ethnographer would, from Mars would come to Israel, yes, and would see the two parties that were fighting in that uh, uh, incident in May 21, it would say basically, it would look to them as both as Arabs. Okay. That's a very important point, because the Hillel, quite typically, yes, always makes it hard. Because he says, if you want to reduce it to ethnicity, then you have a problem. But also, if you want to reduce it to class, you have a problem. Okay? And this is a very, very good example how the Mizrahi question cannot be reduced to class only. And this is pains for me to say, because I'm, I'm an unreconstructed Marxist sometimes. Yes? And it cannot be redu reduced to culture only, and it cannot be reduced to, uh, uh, to, ethnicity, uh, to ethnicity only. What else is he, is he is showing us in terms of the limits of uh, Zionist universalism? It is about friction. And historically, because of the policies of the state, where you know, Mizrahi Jews were settled, Yes, across the, uh, along the old uh, borders, along the old borders of the Green Line. Yes, within, uh, within uh, um, um, uh, specific neighborhoods in what we call mixed cities and so on. This is where, you know, Mizrahim and, and, and Palestinians came to meet. Okay. 
I recently started writing the, uh, uh, a sort of a history of the uh, factory in Kalandia, just north of Jerusalem, where my father worked for many years. So it was a lot of Iraqi Jews and other Mizrahi Jews and a lot of Palestinians from the from northern part of Jerusalem. That was a place of shared life. And where you share life, there's also friction. There was not even one single Ashkenazic person on that site. I used to go there as a kid in the 70s. I remember that once the owner came, and uh, the owner, Mr. Edelman, came, and it was like a, as if God showed up. You know, everybody, Mizrahi and Palestinian, were like, wow, you know. He never really showed up, OK? Now, so friction comes, you know, where you have shared life. It's a function of shared life, OK? And then you have. Um, and, and so that is a, a very, a very important point. In many ways, and perhaps, you know, Hillel could respond to this later, one of the things that comes up is that we see that, you know, with, in, in the case of Mizrahi Palestinian violence, what is absent is the ideological element. Whereas in Ashkenazic, the violence against Palestinians in the West Bank and others, I would say that there would be an ideological element. And that begs a very interesting question, and I would challenge myself. Why do we assign ideology to Ashkenazim, and for Mizrahim, we actually say, OK, well, it's some, something else, OK? If you ask the mainstream in Israel, they will tell you it's Mizrahi hot-headedness, yes? We try to break it down. We say class, ethnicity, friction, geography, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to point this out because it is important, and I will transition to the final uh, 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 um, uh, uh, part, is because you know, one of the points that uh, uh, Hillel uh, uh, raises here is the fact that you know, there, is, there are continuities and there are legacies that build in. And they basically go back to the situation between Palestinians and Mizrahim in, in mandatory Palestine, the pushing of the old Sephardic uh, slash Mizrahi population that existed before Zionism and, and later, they're pushing them out, the rise of a new uh, uh, hegemonic, uh, of a new hegemony with different ideas, yes, that sometimes it results, and I don't say it's deliberate, sometimes it results in, you know, uh, pitching the two other populations against each other, fighting against, uh, fighting in, against work, uh, fighting over work, over work, fighting over uh, um, other uh, means of life, etc., etc., etc. It is not a coincidence that the first movements of protest, of Israeli protest in Israel, in Wadi Salib in 1951, in Musrara in 1970-71 of the Black Panthers, you know, actually started in areas that used to be Palestinian. Okay. I mean, they were both on the borders where Jews and Arabs actually lived together, where they shared life. And there were, uh, and there was also, uh, and there was also uh, uh, friction. Okay, but I think also one of the things that he little hinted at is that shared life also goes the other way. Let me use um, a personal uh, anecdote here. You know, since cannabis was decriminalized in Israel recently, I can say that if you lived in Israel in Jerusalem in the 1970s and the 80s as a teenager who could speak Arabic, there was plenty of shared life to do over that issue. Okay. Because this is where you go to have fun, yes? To some of us, the old city was a place of freedom, you know, because the rules, it was, it was a no man's land in, 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 in that part. And many of the Mizrahi population in Jerusalem actually did most of its business in the markets of East Jerusalem and East Bethlehem and so on. This is well before the, the first intifada, which actually ruined a lot of things. I mentioned this because one of the things that we are doing today is actually celebrating 30 years for uh, Oslo. And one of the tragedies of Oslo is it's separated people. It separated people that actually had shared lives, OK? In other words, before 1993, if you were a Mizrahi worker, you knew a lot more Palestinians as co-workers, yes, uh, than you know today. And maybe part of the violence that we, have to, that we see today is actually that we don't see Palestinians anymore the way we used to see them until 1993. Because the logic of Oslo was also a logic of separation. They are there, we are here. Yes, but of course, you know, they are there, they are here, it's, it's, just, an, it's just an imagination. Yuval Ivry spoke um, a lot about two, two points that I would like to uh, uh, mention here and, 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 this, and uh, um, uh, dwell upon for a second. He spoke about, you know, the in-betweenness, the in-betweenness of the Mizrahi population, in other words, between 
between uh, Palestinians and between uh, Ashkenazim. And he correctly pointed out that this is a trap. Why is it a trap? It is a trap because then we have to be, we, when we think about Middle Eastern Jewish history as a whole and Mizrahi history, we always have to interpret this according to this in betweenness thing. In other words, are Mizrahim pro Arab or against the Arabs? Is Middle Eastern Jewish history a good, a good history of you know, shared life and cohabitation and convivencia between Jews and Muslims and Christians in, in, uh, uh, from all the way from uh, Iraq to Morocco? Yes. Or is it the history of pogroms and persecutions and so on? Do Mizrahim hate Arabs, vote to the right because they hate Arabs because of what they've done to their parents in Iraq, etc., etc., etc.? You have, you will find good answers this way or the other to each of these questions. Okay, rosy history, yes, versus lacrimose history, to quote Salon Baron. Rosy history uh, inside Israel versus uh, shared life inside Israel versus uh, of co-workers versus you know friction and violence. But it always it is the trap, and I say we should need we need to get out of this trap and, and recognize you know that one of the things that Israel has created, even though unintendedly is a new population that self-identifies as Mizrahi and identified and been identified as Mizrahi by the, even by the mainstream in the past two decades. Okay. The second thing that, uh, you know, that Yuval discussed is actually, he, so he used the word legacy a lot. Yes, and here I would like to say something that, uh, again, like to use a, 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 person, a, a personal uh, um, um, uh, uh, anecdote. If you think about, I mentioned here the, the, the collective, the collective, the Mizrahi collective has been mentioned several times. Okay, and I can say that you know the the leadership of that of the current uh, organization that has uh, several hundred uh, uh, people. Okay, actually goes back to 2018. You know, to about 150 people who are actively uh, uh, who are part of the appeal with Palestinian organizations. You know, alongside them, not in between. Yes, but alongside them against the law of the nation. That group from 2018 goes back. In fact, if you go back, I'm going to save you the history, the, the history lesson. Go back to organizations that we started in the Hebrew University in 1990. Some of us came from the far left, and some of us came from the far right. Not from the far right, but from the right, from the center right in the Likud. And we joined together to start you know, a Mizrahi uh, uh, organization within the university to fight for equality, to fight for uh, questions of housing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, and if you go back to that, then you will find out that there is the, 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 these roots go to back to inspired by the tent movements of 1980, and the tent movements by of 1980 was inspired by the Black Panthers movement in the, um, of 1971, going back all the way to uh, to the Vadi, to Vadi Salib. Why do I point the point? Why do I mention the point of uh, um, uh, legacy here and continuity? Is because we need to recognize that there is this, a separate yet. There is a separate history in Israel, and there is a separate collective memory to Mizrahim in Israel. They remember things in a different way. Yes, they remember things in a different way, which is probably the marker of them being a, a, a collective that needs to be uh, um, uh, distinguished. Um, and with that, I would like just to, uh, uh, to finish uh, my response, uh, my sporadic response to um, what we heard. And um, more debate makes the truth clearer. So let's debate. Thank you all for your excellent presentations and response. And uh, at this point, we don't have a lot of time. But I think it would be uh, good um, um, to have some questions from the audience. Um, we can have only questions. What's that? We can have only questions. Questions first. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, actually, my uh, it's a comment that I'd like to Hillel to comment on. Uh, you mentioned uh, you, you related to the May 21 uh, events, uh, which were very traumatic in Jewish-Arab relations. I would say. In velocity, they were pretty much as similar to the October 2000 clashes. Uh, Professor Sami Smucha wrote an article. He called it the lost decade in Jewish-Arab relations. 
he, he wrote it in October 2010, and basically he claimed that it took almost 10 years to repair Jewish-Arab relations from the trauma of October 2000 clashes. While most of us believe today that the May 21 events, it took almost only one year to heal from them. That as if they're already behind us, as if we went forward, and it seems that there were a couple, a few elements that caused that. One is civil society organizations that knew how to step in and try to work on the healing process. A second, the fact that there was an Arab party in the coalition which gave a political umbrella for that healing process. Uh, and the, the third was the engagement of the uh, business community into the healing process. We all saw the huge billboards in the middle of Tel Aviv, Miftahim Insurance Company calling for shared society. And I thought, what's going on here? This is my job, not the job of Miftahim not the job of insurance companies, but it seems that those kind of businesses started feeling that uh, they have a vested interest in trying to protect or to heal Jewish-Arab relations so that this does not affect their business, whether it is the makeup of their staff, which is beginning to be mixed Jewish and Arab staff, or their clientele. By the emergence of uh, Arab middle class, people in the Arab community started buying uh, health insurance, or maybe not health insurance, but uh, life insurance, and things that they were not used to have to buy when they were of a much lower economic capacity. Well, I don't know what to do with your optimism. I mean, I hope it's in, it's constructive, because I think that if you make a poll among Bankvir uh, supporters, you would find out that. 90% of them would, would, would mention 20, 21st riot as the reason for, for, for voting for Bengvir. What I mean is that it's true that on the surface, the relations between Jews and Arabs recovered quite fast. But among many, many, many Jews, this is not the case. For them, it is still, until now, that we Jews are under attack of the Israeli Arabs. So... That's the narrative of Benji, but it doesn't seem to be the narrative of the majority. It's not the narrative of the majority. It's narrative of the voters of Benkvir. And Benkvir rose from, I don't know their numbers, from X to X three times. So, so it has its effect, because now they are, they, he is a minister of... of, of uh, internal security. Any other questions? So let me uh, maybe give... Oh, I'm sorry, I missed... Oh, please, please. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you guys see that we could use uh, and take advantage of what's happening now in Israel. You know, you talked... I, very um, poignantly about why you feel like there's no place there for the Mizrahim. But what could be done by the fact that there is this protest movement, there is a beginning of more recognition, I think more people willing to grapple with these issues and to hear it and see it. So what could be done to take advantage of this and really bring these issues of the past uh, you know, to, to this moment? Just another question. Um, since we talked about quite a few different groups. I wonder if anybody wants to address the relationship between Ethiopian Jews and Mizrahim in Israel. Okay, so uh, let's start first with the first question. Who would like to answer? I, I can try. Please, Yuva. Uh, I think that um, uh, what I'm trying to, to say, I think it's the same with the Mizrahi Civic Collective, and, and as we said, it's not the first time. So if, I think in, the, in this kind of history, if you go from this history, this reform is not a, a, like an epic moment. It's a very important moment, but there's other moments in the past that uh, raise different kind of possibilities and options. But this one is, is continuation in that sense. So I think what the Mizrahi Civic uh, Collective is doing is writing uh, programs for the future. But when you're talking about the future, you can't go back now. I think that part of what now the, I think the problem, one of the problems that the, the, the protest against the reform now is doing is, is, um, 
is still staying in these kind of binaries and still trying to tell us that there used to be a democ great democracy a moment before, just uh, when Levin came, everything was great before, and, and we know that that's not the case. There, was, there were many, many problems in the Israeli society, uh, with, not only with Arabs, with Mizrahi, with Ethiopian Jews, with, uh, you know, we, we are asylum seekers, we, we have so many problems that wasn't addressed. So this kind of narrative is, is, not, is not efficient and it's not right. And I think it, even doing problems of what, you know, for many years we were against this kind of, um, we tried to diversify the Israeli uh, discourse and not going back again to the, you know, the, to the Israeli uh, uh, pilots and the Israeli ex-commanders. And I see, you know, I'm following from afar, but I listen to it and I listen to the same kind of narrative is coming back. Everybody's starting to talk, my father is a pilot, ex-pilot, or is the pilot, and, the, and all the, you know, the narrative that we try to fix for, for many, many years, and Mizrahi Jews were part of it, but not only Mizrahi Jews, other groups, feminist groups, and other groups, are returning in full force. And I think that what we need to do is to think for the future, but from different kind of narratives. That's why going back to these kind of possibilities, not only the Mizrahi, but possibilities that thought outside of this partition even you know, one of, of the solutions, it's, uh, I, with I was sure that it's a joke, the separation between Israel, uh, Israel and you, you, Judah, and, the, and you see the map, you, you, you're puzzled. You know, it's, it's amazing. You know, where is Be'er Sheva? Where is, uh, yeah, the, it's, it's very much into these kind of partitions that are coming back and hunting us. And I think thinking outside of that, one of the possibilities is going to the Mizrahi, but not only the Mizrahi, other possibility that was there outside of it. Let me take advantage of my... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Can I also answer? I think that there is... Um, also, you talked about the pilot, but also there is, like, a patronizing attitude that still um, exists in what we generally call the, the leftist camp that leads the demonstrations. Uh, I know it's not only leftist, but... Um, there is kind of um, impossible to recognize these stories. And uh, I also didn't join the demonstrations, though I realized that I really want this demonstration to succeed, but I can't go there. Um, and there is something that no, but the Mizrahi and the Ethiopian, it just, let, let's do now the democracy and we'll deal with these issues later or these issues are part of our history. We shouldn't be in this pain anymore. This is belong to the past. And I think also the Labour Party, when they managed to recognize what Mizrahi uh, been going through from the 50s until today, and we see it in statistics, um, it was too little and too late. And uh, I think someone mentioned, uh, I don't know if it was today, uh, wow, it was very intense couple of days, so uh, that there is even a feeling of revenge, and this is really live things. Um, also, just to add to what uh, Professor Michael said, uh, I think the relationship between Mizrahi and Ethiopians are a relationship between two marginalized community, that one is a little bit less marginalized, thanks to other groups that arrived, around a million of uh, uh, Russian speakers and Ethiopians, and uh, more marginalized Palestinian communities. So, of course, also Ethiopian Jews were settled in Jaffa due to uh, the integration policies of the State of Israel. So they were a tool in the process of judifying uh, specific areas. And the poorest Jewish communities there is uh, Mizrahi Jews, of course, that also uh, suffer from this uh, marginalization, but also like, you know, the, the manager of the grocery store is Moroccan and the, the principal of the school is Iraqi. So the first immediate, um, uh, like, um, um, uh, conflicts are direct to this issue, uh, the, the direct to, from Mizrahi, also police officers. Police officers are 
um, many times uh, the senior, uh, also the seniors are mostly uh, from Mizrahi, but I also like to, to American audience, I want to compare it to the American Jewish relationship and black Americans where, um, where American Jews were able to cross to the white side of the, of, of this space and blacks stayed in the same place and they turned to be the principal of the school, the, the local pizzeria, Jews or Italians, and this is the relationship that, that uh, usually in the daily, on a daily basis, uh, Ethiopian Jews do not meet Ashkenazi if they are still in the periphery. Like, I mostly met Ashkenazi in the university. Uh, it was much less before that, so I think, yeah. Well, let me add something. I think the uh, main or the most important road for uh, um, those who protest against uh, the so-called reform is to acknowledge that um, there have been terrible things historically done to Mizrahim in Israel, to uh, Ethiopian Jews, to uh, asylum seekers and to others, and to come to terms with that to discuss it in an open way, not treat it as a taboo, as a word which should not be said. Uh, and then, you know, words only are not enough. There should be some work done. Um, the Zionist left has to mend their ways and to understand that what happened years ago is not uh, going to uh, happen again. And if this struggle for democracy is really important, there should be some action uh, and uh, beyond introspection, also um, establishing a new political agenda that includes everyone and don't leave uh, marginalized groups outside the camp. And as we all know, there's a lot of formal and informal discrimination in Israel. And uh, you've heard a lot about it, uh, I think, here and um, before today, uh, when um, uh, the situation of the Palestinian citizens of Israel was discussed. And the Zionist left has to come to terms with that. And to understand that, there's no way back, but there is a way, and I think a promising way toward the future. But that requires introspection and mending the ways. Yeah. Uh, any other question or comment from the audience? Yeah, it's perfect ending. <laughs> okay, so thank you all very much. Thank you.